Welcome, everybody. It's my great pleasure to introduce Peter Bubenik from the University of Florida. Um, Peter is actually the founding director of the AATRN seminar. So the seminar started as an outgrowth of the 2013-2014 thematic year on applied topology at the Institute of Mathematics, um, the IMA in Minnesota. And uh, Peter and Fadil Santosa had the foresight to start doing online mathematics, which is really led to um, how we do things in the seminar and our, our library of, of 100 and vid, uh, 180 videos on YouTube. So we're very uh, grateful for Peter for all his work in founding the seminar and uh, honored to have him back today to, uh, to speak to us. So thanks so much, Peter, and please take it away. All right, thank you very much. So yeah, thank you to Henry, Sarah, and Elhanan for inviting me and for doing such a great job in running the research network. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to see all the fantastic talks being presented and in particular, all the great research being done by, by young researchers. Uh, I think it, it really bodes well for our subject and it's great that you guys are, are, are kind of building that community. So thank you for doing that. Um, all right, let me try to share my screen here. Uh, give me one second to do that. All right, so hopefully everybody can see that. Uh, yeah, so today I'm going to be presenting joint work with uh, Nikola Milicevic, who's a uh, graduate student at the University of Florida working with me. And uh, yeah, this is primarily his work, uh, so I'm excited to be talking about it today. And uh, there, it's a subject or part of a subject that uh, has attracted a, a fair bit of recent work. Uh, there's a number of uh, other papers that you should look at uh, by other authors that take slightly different points of view, uh, some of which cover the same territory. Uh, so these are kind of on, on the bottom right here. Uh, the, the graded module perspective on persistence modules goes back to early work by Zimmerodian and Carlson. Uh, and in the kind of continuous case, it's in the multi-parameter cases uh, looked at in the thesis of Mike Lesnick. Uh, some of the more recent stuff I'm gonna be looking at toward the end of the talk is, is also been, uh, had a related work by uh, Hitesh Kakar and Jose Prea, uh, Polterovich and collaborators, uh, Ezra Miller has a, has a bunch of papers that uh, uh, do work in this area, and there's also a nice recent paper by uh, Carlson and Filipenko. Uh, uh, our paper is on the archive, so please check it out if you're interested in this. Uh, and without further ado, let me get started. Uh, I'm not going to assume that you know anything about homological algebra, uh, and I'm going to start by uh, reviewing persistence modules. Okay, so, um, so if you're looking at things algebraically, these are kind of the main things of study in uh, persistent homology. And they arise usually from something geometric. So we have here a filtered uh, complex uh, more abstractly, it's a diagram of topological spaces, uh, but computationally we have finitely many uh, simplicial complexes with maps between them, and the most common and easiest setting is when all the maps are inclusions. Uh, so this is sometimes called a filtered simplicial complex. Uh, here we have the triangle thought of as a simplicial complex, so we have three vertices, three edges, and one face. And each of those appear at distinct times. Uh, one, two, the vertices appearing first in this case, then the edges, and then the, the two-dimensional face. And we can think of this as a movie. Uh, and either the frames have a discrete, either there's a discrete number of frames like we've pictured here. Uh, that's that's a fine point of view. Though for today's talk, I'm going to adopt the continuous point of view. So we really think of this as being a continuous movie indexed by all real valued times. Uh, and it's maybe kind of a boring movie in that there's only kind of a, a small number of frames that are different and otherwise 
uh, almost all of them are the same. Okay. So uh, how do we turn this into a persistence module? Uh, well, we apply homology. Uh, let me denote that by capital H. So it's going to be homology in some degree. So some fixed degree, one, for example, uh, with coefficients in some fixed field. And I'm going to use lowercase k to denote the field. Uh, computationally, of course, uh, our favorite field is uh, the binary field with just zero and one. We do Z mod two arithmetic, uh, binary arithmetic. Uh, and the reason we love that is because computers love that uh, binary arithmetic is uh, encoded in hardware at the most basic level. So everything is very fast if we use uh, that field of coefficients. All right. Now, if we do this uh, and we take the continuous point of view, then for every real number, uh, we have a vector space M sub A, which we get by taking the homology of this filtered simplicial complex. And so I need to give it some notation. Uh, let me call it X. And then I'm going to use the subscript to denote the time, time parameter. OK, so we take homology at time A. And this gives us a vector space with coefficients in K. All right. And now, of course, the, the most important thing about homology is that it's functorial. So not only do we get vector spaces, but we get linear maps between them. So whenever A is less than or equal to B, we have vector spaces MA and MB, and there is a uh, linear map between them. All right. And uh, this also works in much greater generality. Um, and in particular, We can have things varying in multiple parameters. Uh, so this gives us multi-parameter persistence modules. Uh, everything that I'm going to be talking about today can be done in that setting. And in fact, in the paper, we use uh, that setting and even, even greater generality, if you like. Uh, but for today's talk, everything's just going to be indexed by the real numbers. OK. Um, now. Uh, so persistence modules, maybe you've seen before, uh, but I want to take a slightly unconventional view on them, or at least something that's not always done. Uh, I think in most presentations, this doesn't come up, but it does go back to the very earliest papers, which is the graded module point of view. So I'm going to explain what that is. Uh, so remember we had, uh, for every real number now, we have a vector space. We have uncountably many vector spaces. And uh, what we're going to do is to take the direct sum of all of them. All right, that seems crazy. We're taking a direct sum of uncountably many vector spaces. How can we possibly do anything with that? Uh, well, the trick is something slightly subtle in the definition of a direct sum which is that even if, even if we have an arbitrary indexing set, elements of the direct sum are non-zero only in finitely many places, okay? So if we have any arbitrary element in this direct sum, it's really only a, a it can be written as a finite sum. So we have finitely many vectors uh, from finitely many of these vector spaces. So each of these VIs is in one, uh, one as at one time parameter A sub I. All right. Now, 
there, there's something that's missing in this notation, which is that we don't keep track of where all of these vectors live. So I'm going to formally add in that information with the bookkeeping device. And I'm going to use the most famous bookkeeping device in mathematics, the most important one, which is that of a variable. So I'm going to stick in a variable there. And I think of this as a formal sum. And I'm going to do something a little unusual. I'm not going to use subscripts for my vari to my variable, but I'm going to use exponents to differentiate between them. All right. OK, and now notice that this I've written it as a polynomial, which might seem kind of funny, but it turns out that polynomial arithmetic gives us exactly what we want. So let me explain that to you. All right. So, so what do we have here? So this, this thing here is now something called the R, R graded K vector space. Okay, meaning that it's split up into different gradings, so it's kind of split up like a cheese grater. We can split it up. Uh, for each real number, we've got one piece. Uh, the, the pieces that are only in one degree are the homogeneous pieces, and any element is a finite sum of homogeneous pieces. In fact, it's a polynomial. Uh, we can write it as a polynomial. Okay, okay. now. Uh, something more is true. So in fact, and uh, M is a module of the monoid ring. Now I'm going to be using words that might not be familiar with you. Monoid ring of polynomials in variables x to the a where a is non-negative. Okay, all right, I'm gonna explain how this works in just a second, but uh, the great thing here is that persistence modules are modules in the sense of abstract algebra, okay? Uh, which is not always there in the way they're often presented. Okay, so how does this work? Uh, so let me show you an example. All right, uh, the nicest modules to work with are the interval modules. These are kind of the simplest non-zero modules. Uh, they are one dimensional for some interval and they are zero outside that interval. And within that interval, so they are one dimensional, meaning that they're just the coefficient field. And all the maps are identity maps, okay. And now we're going to take arbitrary elements of this persistence module, and those are polynomials. Okay, they are finite sums of things that are non-zero and are homogeneous. And so let me take let me take two particular spots in this interval. Let's say two and eight, and uh, the basis element. Uh, oops, let me not do that. Uh, the basis element in this one dimensional vector space is just the element one here in the field. And uh, so I have one times x squared, which is just x squared. Again, the basis element here is one times x to the eight, which is just x eight. So adding them together, I have x squared plus x to the eighth. And this is an element in our persistence module. Oops. All right. Uh, so these are the elements of the persistence module. And now, uh, how does this action of this monoid ring work? Okay. The monoid ring is generated by monomials. Uh, so to just sorry, define can the I have a this... question? Yes, please. Um, so my question is: You're at the beginning, sort of here on the on the top of the screen. Your a is a real number. And then two lines later, you say that A has to be non-negative. So the only place it has to be non-negative is for this action that I'm about to describe. Okay. And the reason for that is what, what, I'll, what we'll see soon is the action is coming from maps in the persistence module. 
and the maps in the persistence module only go in one direction. Okay, this is kind of a subtlety. Uh, it is really crucial for our whole persistent homology machinery, which is that the, the maps in the persistence module only go in one direction. Okay, but okay. if your interval were not one to nine, but minus one to nine? So the, the would... non-negative part we haven't come to yet. Okay. Ah, okay. So the, okay. The, the, where the interval lives on the real numbers, it can be positive, negative, that is fine. Uh, the so in the language of abstract algebra the module is kind of positive or negative but it's a module over some ring or some algebra and that and that thing that is acting on the module is is non-negative okay thank you okay so great question uh okay i'm so i'm about to show something that will hopefully be helpful towards your question okay so i'm going to act on this element here by a monomial and so i need to show you how that works so i'm going to pick a particular monomial i'm going to pick x cubed all right and x cubed is going to be the 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 action here is compatible with the grading it's coming from the grading so the cubed is three and in a case that we're shifting everything forward three spots in the grading. So in particular, something that's in the X squared, the time two spot is gonna be moved to time five. And how do we check what it's sent to? Well, we just use the map of the persistence module and notice that I had everything being the identity map. So the basis element here gets sent to a basis element here and so x squared, which is the basis element at time two, gets sent to the basis element x, x at time five, which is x to, the five, x to the fifth. Okay, so we have x cubed acting on x squared plus x to the eighth is x five. That's the part com that's coming from here. And now I have to look at the action of x cubed on x to the eighth. Now here, notice that we're, gets, we're being sent from time eight to time 11 and at time 11 that persistence module is zero okay so the map from the persistence module sends everything to zero so this is the end of the story so x cubed times x squared plus x to the eight for this persistence module is equal to x to the fifth all right okay so again if you haven't seen this before maybe you need to work out some examples but hopefully this is is helpful uh, I want to look at one more example, which is actually kind of an easier example, this unbounded interval here from one to infinity. And uh, this interval module has a, a nice property. So K one to infinity is something called a free module. So I'll explain what this is right away. So if we take any element in this interval module, it's non-zero, and we take any non-negative real number t, then if we act on w by the monomial x to the t, it's non-zero. Okay, why is that? So we take uh, anything non-negative, the action of x to the t just moves us forward t using this map here from the interval module, but all those maps are identity maps. So non-zero things get sent to non-zero things. All right, so these guys here are free modules. Okay, we will use that later. All right, a um, couple more ingredients. Uh, now that we know about free modules, we can do something kind of cool that's part of the usual construction, but is is hiding maybe, and is something that's not usually considered. So uh, going back to the first example, we had a chain complex of persistence modules. Uh, sorry, our first example, we have a filtered simplicial complex 
and we got a persistence module by taking persistent homology. All right, I'm going to introduce an intermediate step here. Uh, so, uh, which is that this construction here can be thought of as factoring through uh, something that I'm going to describe in a second called chain complexes of free, uh, free with two E's, free persistence modules. All right. And of course, something I neglected to say at the beginning is please uh, continue to interrupt me with questions. So uh, one person was brave enough to do that. I hope to hear from more of you. Uh, so, so please continue with the questions. All right. So what is this mapping? Uh, a, a bit of, let me remind you of our notation here. We call this filtered simplicial complex X. Uh, I'm going to send that to K chain complex K. Let me describe what that is. All right, so it's a very simple construction. It's a free persistence module. So it's going to be a direct sum of interval modules that have a left endpoint, but no right endpoint. Okay, and how do we get these? Well, for each simplex in our filtered simplicial complex, it's born at a particular time. Uh, the algebraic counterpart is just going to be a interval module that has a generator at that time. Okay, so for example, our three vertices, which are born at time one, two, and three, give us these three free modules. We just take the direct sum, and that gives us the part of our chain complex in degree zero. Uh, for the chain complex in degree one, these are free modules corresponding to the edges that appear in our filtered simplicial complex. And then we have uh, well, we had one two simplex, which gives us the one free module in degree two of our chain complex. All right, so um, chain complexes, uh, our chain complex I call K. These are usually written with uh, a picture like this. And we have the only thing that's missing are the boundary maps. And well, what are the boundary maps? Well, they're just the ones that are induced by the geometry of the simplicial complex. Okay, so um, so very quickly, for example, this generator here at time four uh, corresponds to this edge. Its boundary are these two vertices which are born at times one and two. Uh, so at time four, we just send that to the sum of two things, which is the uh, basis element at time two of this interval module. Sorry, at time four at this interval module and the basis element at time four of this interval module. Okay, it's very simple. It's just, just what it has to be. And if you do that and compute homology, uh, surprise, surprise, we, we get the answer that we expect it, that we would expect. So let me write that down for you. So H0 of K is going to be a direct sum of three things. And homology will no longer be a free module. Hey, Peter, can I squeeze a question in? Yes, please. I don't want to break your concentration while you're writing all these out. No, go um, ahead and keep asking. Ask. So, so um, am I correct? This is uh, this process of going to from the filtered complex to the persistence module via this change complex of persistence modules is really just factoring the homology functor through this chain functor, right? Right, the functor that takes the individual um, the individual, uh, I don't want to use the word complex here, let's say <laughs> spaces in the filtration to their chain complexes. Yes. I see. And so, um, all right, so, so it's just, it's just, if you took this view of persistence modules, like maybe more abstractly as just in terms of vector spaces and not necessarily uh, homology groups, 
right? Not necessarily a vector space is coming from a homology functor, right? Like this kind of purely quiver view of uh, persistence. Then this was just another persistence module. Yes. Okay. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with everything that you said. So. Um, Peter, can I ask a question too? Sure. Yeah, so uh, a very naive question here. Um, so you're using burst time to factor through. Is death time kind of coming also in an equivalence way? If I'm thinking about some form of duality, could I think about death time in terms of factorization as well? For example, that, that for example, when, I, when my edge four comes in, my vertices, you know, between vertices one and two, one of them disappeared, right? So I can think about the, you're using burst time in K0, K1, K2. Can I also think about the modules in terms of the death time? Is that even a reasonable thing to do? Um, it sounds interesting and I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I don't see a way to do that off the top of my head, but it sounds interesting. And Those are just definitely, images. definitely duality is, a, is an important uh, part of this uh, uh, approach that I'm not getting into today. Uh, okay. Uh, I see Nicola wants to tell you <laughs> something. So uh, I think what you're asking is those are just the images with the boundary maps. Uh, they're also free modules. They're just sub modules of the corresponding uh, chain of modules. Because like, what, what you're saying is you can use the that time as a, to construct a free module. Yeah, that's exactly what you get when you use the image of D1. You get the, the module, which is, uh, uh, what is it, for infinity or something like that. Yes. Yeah, we can we can take it offline because I was almost thinking about there is a du duality in here, um, but we can discuss this more offline. Yeah, so the dualities are, there are dualities here, and maybe we can talk about them at the end or offline. Yeah. Uh, and, and and we we do we do talk about them in our paper. All right. Um, okay, fantastic. Uh, I have one more construction before we can get into the homological algebra, and uh, that is that we can multiply persistence modules. Okay, and I'm going to stick with interval modules. We multiply interval modules. And this is a generalization of the tensor product that comes from graded module theory. Uh, so graded modules is often something that might be done in like a graduate course in algebra. And almost always things are graded by the integers. Uh, uh, but it, here we're in the continuous setting, but it turns out that we can kind of extend the ideas of, of graded module theory to that setting. And when we take the tensor product of graded things, uh, each of those things has pieces in different degrees. And uh, the, the basic idea is that uh, we take one thing in degree A, another thing in degree C. When we multiply them together, it ends up in degree A plus C. All right, it, it's kind of the obvious thing to do. Uh, so here we have two interval modules one of which has things in degrees between A and B, the other thing has things in degree between C and D. Uh, we take all possible pairs of those things and we get this rectangle of products of pairs of things from the, the starting interval modules. And they live in degrees between A plus C and B plus D. Uh, now we started with two one dimensional things, we take the tensor product, we kind of want to end up with a one dimensional thing. And if we just take everything in this rectangle, we have like an uncountable dimensional vector space. We don't want to do that. We want to identify things that kind of can be ultimately traced back to the same, same thing. And in the interval module, everything comes from one generator. Uh, so when we look at a bunch of pairs here, this lower black, Di diagonal line here. Uh, everything that's there is coming from products here and here, but all of those can be kind of traced back to the generators A and C. So the right thing to do is to somehow quotient to identify those. 
Uh, so if you do that and you write down the definition, what you notice is that once you move to this part here, you also not only identify all the black things on the black diagonal, you also end up identifying them with things that kind of fall outside the rectangle, which is zero. Uh, so it turns out that everything on this black line ends up having to be sent to zero. Uh, so uh, our persistence module will start at A plus C and then stops whenever we hit one of the diagonals, one of the corner points of the rectangle. Okay, so let me write down the formula for you. So we have this tensor product is equal to, so we start at A plus C, and then we end at the first corner point. Okay, so this is our formula for the tensor product. And uh, I wanna point out two things, one of which is that it's symmetric. So the order doesn't matter. And uh, I also want to record a special case of this that we'll use later, which is that um, if D is infinity, then this formula simplifies. Um, and we see that uh, taking a tensor product with this free interval module has the effect of just shifting the interval module uh, by, by C. All right. Okay. So, uh, so we've seen a bunch of cool stuff. Uh, hopefully some of it's been interesting. And now I'm ready to dive into the, the meat of the talk, which is homological algebra. And I'm assuming you haven't seen this before. So let me say a few things about homological algebra. And actually, one, one, one thing I forgot to mention is that uh, this tensor product takes two persistence modules and gives us one persistence module. Now, if we fix one of those input persistence modules, then we have a mapping from persistence modules to persistence modules. It turns out this map is functorial. It's a functor from persistence modules to persistence modules. Okay, hold that thought. All right, now, uh, so let's fix a persistence module N. This is gonna be the fixed one in the tensor product. So it's gonna give us a functor from persistence modules to persistence modules. Um, now, in linear algebra, one of the, maybe one of the big uh, things in persistence modules, the rank nullity theorem. If you've ever been asked to compute Betty numbers using linear algebra, uh, then you end up doing some matrix reduction, you get ranks of different matrices. And what you really want is like uh, dimensions of kernels and images, and you end up using this rank nullity formula uh, a whole bunch of times till you get the Betty numbers that you want. Uh, so if we generalize linear algebra, which we do in abstract algebra, the right generalization of the Neurac nullity theorem is something called a short exact sequence. All right, so this is what we have here. Uh, so we have three persistence modules uh, with maps between them. And they have a particularly nice property, which is that the kernel equals the image at each spot of the sequence. All right. So in particular, the last map here is onto this map is this is surjective, this is injective, and in the middle here, the kernel of this map is the image of that map. Uh, this is a really useful computational tool. If you have a short exact sequence, you can uh, use information about two to three of these things to tell you a lot about the third one. All right, so if we, now we now have this functor, which is a tensor product with N, uh, which we can apply to a short exact sequence. And one might hope that again, we get a short exact sequence and now we can compute stuff with, about tensor products. Uh, it turns out that only kind of works. Okay, so we apply tensor product with N, what happens? We get an exact 
sequence that's almost what we want. All right, not quite, almost. Uh, it fails at the beginning. The first map is not necessarily injective. All right, um, but in some cases it does work. When does it work? Um, uh, we have, we do ha do have a short exact sequence. So we have something that looks like this. If and only if n is somehow has some nice properties, n has a, a nice property which is that it's which has a name called projective. Okay, uh, I'm not going to define what it is, uh, but since this is an if and only if, uh, we can actually take this to be the definition. So the left hand side, uh, being short exact sequence for all exact sequences, uh, is the definition of projective for the purpose of this talk. And the only other thing we need to know about projective is that it's implied by another condition that we've already seen is that N is a free persistence module. Okay, so free interval modules are projective uh, if they are if they are semi-infinite in the right direction, uh, and those are the only projective modules that we're going to be using. Okay, uh, so if N is not projective. It turns out that this sequence here can be extended to the left. Okay, uh, so in general, we have this exact sequence here, which has consecutive terms, which I've given names for. Uh, and I'm going to show you how to compute them actually. Uh, they're called Tor modules. Uh, and they're, the great thing is, there's a recipe for computing them. Okay. There's a recipe. I'm going to tell you what it is, and we're going to see how it works. Um, all right, they're all of this form. Uh, and there's a simple three step recipe for getting them. Um, Okay, the first one is involves something you haven't seen before, which is to take a projective resolution of M. The second step is to apply our functor, which is the tensor product of N. And it turns out then that gives us something we, we've seen before, which is a chain complex of persistence modules. And we just take homology of that, which is also something we know how to do. All right, so let's see how this works with one example. All right, so again, we're gonna work with interval modules and um, so we want a projective resolution. The first thing we need is, so we want, it's gonna be a free resolution. So we want a surjective map from a free interval module onto this module that starts at A. Well, there's only really one that works, which is the one that starts like this. This is a surjective map of persistence modules. And now you build it up iteratively. You look at the kernel of that map which starts at B. So these are arrows here. These go all the way out. Uh, it turns out the kernel is already a free module. So actually this finishes the story. In this case, all the higher terms can be zero. This is a projective resolution of our interval module. So this is Call this P0, P1. And so that's step one. Step two, apply the tensor product. Uh, remember that uh, tensor products with free modules just shift. Okay. So, so we just shift the interval from A to B over by C and over by B. And we get this uh, chain 
complex of persistence modules. Uh, we take its homology and uh, there's nothing in higher degrees. So all the higher tors are zero. There's only tor one, which is gonna be H1 of this complex. Uh, and remember homology is kernel modulo image. The image is zero. So it's just the kernel of this map D1. Uh, what does this map D1 look like? It's a map between interval modules. And we just need to compute what that is. And uh, if I, it's just going to be this bit here is the kernel. Okay, it ends at B plus D and it starts, actually can start, there's two cases. It, you can either start at A plus D or B plus C is bigger than A plus D then these two interval modules are actually disjoint. Okay, so we have two cases. Uh, let me give you the formula that includes both of them. Um, so max of A plus D, B plus C, and then it ends at B plus D. All right, uh, you may need to reread that a few times for that to make sense. Okay, great, we've computed Tor, all right? I bet you didn't wake up and realize you were gonna do that today. So uh, that's the hard work, that's the end of the hard work. Uh, I'm, I'm basically out of time, so let me just uh, mention that this is just the beginning, homological algebra, is uh, a powerful, powerful set of tools that was developed over, uh, it's a big part of 20th century mathematics. And uh, some of it, uh, a, a, a fair bit of it, a fair bit of tools of homological algebra we do have in our paper. Uh, here are some highlights. We have Kunith theorems and universal coefficient theorems. Uh, we can take persistent homology with coefficients in a persistence module. All right, this is kind of wild. Uh, uh, mathematically, it's cool. And actually, I hope that computationally, this is an interesting thing to do. Uh, in other, set, other places in algebraic topology, when you say want to take homology with integer coefficients and you can't do it, uh, you switch to another coefficients that are easier to work with. Uh, a field, for example, or you can take coefficients in crazier things like sheaves or something, and it might give you more information. Uh, so I'm hopeful that this might be useful computationally, uh, though I don't have any evidence of that at the moment. Uh, but many of you are computational people, so something to think about. Uh, persistent multi-parameter persistence is something that's hard. Maybe the right coefficients might make things easier. Uh, there's kind of a dual story to the tensor product, which is uh, there's a HOM functor. Uh, you can, between any two persistence module, there's a persistence module describing the morphisms between them. Uh, there's a corresponding derived functor called ext. Uh, this is very classical. It applies in our setting. Uh, in our paper, we classify the projective and injective and flat interval modules. Uh, in other settings, there's a HOM tensor adjunction. We do have that here. Uh, that leads to lots of nice structure. Uh, persistence modules are something called a closed symmetric monoidal category, uh, which allows you to do enriched category theory. So persistence modules are enriched over themselves. Uh, one other thing that I didn't mention at all, which is that uh, in parallel to the graded module point of view, there's a sheaf point of view of persistence modules. Uh, you can do all of this using that point of view and you get similar results that are actually different. Uh, so there's a, uh, a story there that uh, I invite you to take a look at. And with that, I will end my talk. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Before we get to questions, let's all briefly unmute ourselves and applaud and then mute ourselves again. So let me uh, start with a question um, from the chat. Uh, Zilong Lee asks, it seems like what is done here is all for one dimensional persistence modules. How about in the multi-dimensional case? So I think you touched on that at the very beginning, Peter, but maybe of. Yeah, so let me maybe say that again. So, uh, so one of the great things about 
persistent homology is a very flexible tool and there's different things that have are very great interest in applications uh, and maybe the biggest one is that you may have multiple parameters uh, indexing the objects that you're studying and you want them all to be varying. Uh, this leads very naturally to multi-parameter persistent homology. Uh, so everything that I've talked about can be done in that setting. Uh, computationally, things might get harder. We don't like necessarily have a classification of what the projective and injective modules are. Uh, Ezra Miller, who I mentioned at the beginning, his work really uh, looks at that setting very seriously. Uh, our paper does as well, but he has a, a, a lot of tools as well for that setting that I encourage you to look at. Uh, and yeah, definitely there, there's lots of interesting work to be done there. And part of the purpose is uh, introducing homologic algebra to study persistence modules is maybe to allow us to uh, build on tools that algebraic topologists have developed and uh, to tackle that setting. So uh, <laughs> Bay Wong, I believe, has a question. Bay, do you want to just unmute yourself and ask it? Yeah, I'll just unmute myself. So um, Peter, do you mind sharing the slides right before section six? Sure, let's go back to that. All right. Right. So, 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 if I understand this particular example, your input is uh, you have um, M and N, and then you try to figure out towards end what is the definition of the tour of M N. But in between, the first step is you are trying to figure out this sort of almost like you know, lack of better word, exact sequences. Um, so the question is, you start with A B, which is M. And you started by having another map going from A infinity to A B and further from B infinity to A infinity. Are those map comes naturally in a way? Like, you know, I mean, what is sort of the recipe here when you find those maps? So, um, so I think here there it's easy and there, there I would say the obvious maps. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the warning is that projective resolutions are not canonical in the sense that uh, there's choices to be made when you're building a projective resolution. That's the usual setting. Uh, but what you can show and uh, what's a, a main part of if you're teaching a course on homological algebra is to prove a theorem that the homology that you end up with doesn't depend on the choice of projective resolution. I see. Okay, good. So basically, regardless of, you know, in some sense, there might be multiple candidates I can choose, but the ultimate homological uh, results, therefore, the Tor computation is going to be unique, regardless of the choice of initial maps. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Great question. So I have one question, uh, kind of almost connecting to this. Um, you've done everything here with interval modules throughout. And so if we are in a setting where we have an interval decomposition, module decomposition for all persistence modules, it seems relatively easy to see how everything just generalizes to arbitrary and persistence modules. Have you done any thinking about uh, the weird cases when interval module decompositions break down? <laughs> uh, that is a great question. Uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> uh, so uh, so I, at the beginning of your question, I, I think there's an important point there maybe that I didn't emphasize, which is that um, I'm looking at a very special case of interval modules. In the one parameter case, uh, we have fantastic structure theorems that in nice settings, uh, one parameter persistence modules decompose into direct sums of interval modules. Uh, and because all of these constructions are linear, uh, working with tensor products of interval modules actually gives you the whole story because you just kind of extend by linearity to give you the general case. Uh, now that's the general case for things that are direct sums of interval modules. And what 
MVJ is asking is a great question is there's some interesting things uh, kind of uh, there is one parameter persistence modules, for example, that are not decomposable. And so uh, the broader question maybe would be is, does homological algebra shed any light on working with these? And uh, that's a good question. I haven't thought about that. Are there questions? Um, can I have a one more philosophical question? Um, there's this magic tool earlier, also in this exact slides where you define N is um, projective, right? So can you say a bit more about what is a nice property do you bring once you put this condition there? I feel like this is, seems like a, a magic, you know, ingredient somewhere to make things behave well. Can you say something about, you know, under this condition, why so, is it starting to behave well? Uh, so it, the property is very much a mathematician's property in that they are defined to be persistence modules that allow you to do what you want to do. So in particular, when you're building these resolutions, uh, you have certain maps that are given to you and you want, you, there's a certain map that you need uh, to do the construction. And uh, and then you want things to commute and you just define a module to be projective if there exists this map in all cases. So it's, it's kind of a, a lifting map. It's a lifting property in a way. Uh, okay. And then there, there's dual, uh, there's a dual setting where all the maps are flipped and you have injective modules and then they have a certain, uh, so like one of them's in a, they, they, one of them is like a lifting property and the, the, the other one's an extension property. Uh, and then uh, if you're an algebraist studying ring theory, then you uh, want to know, well, what, what exactly, what modules over this ring are actually having this property? And then you, um, uh, and then, I mean, people have other equivalent formulations in, in particular settings, but uh, if you're working kind of in the most general setting, then it's really just these, these properties that you have to work with. And, and there, there's kind of a list of equivalent things. And one of the equivalent thing is that, that we have this, uh, this guy being a short exact sequence. Cool, thanks. You're welcome. Can I have a quick question too, actually? Sure. Um, so this is a, both a philosophical and mathematical question. So uh, the question is, is as follows. So for all of these uh, homological algebra constructions, uh, on a persistence module, which comes from, say, a filtration on a topological space, is there a topological operation which induces it? So, like, maybe the HOM corresponds to some persistence of some mapping cone construction, or if that question makes sense. In other words, can all of these operations be interpreted either geometrically or topologically as the persistences of derived filtrations on derived spaces? That is a fantastic question. And uh, you've actually jumped to something that, <laughs> that took me a while to get to, which is that uh, if, if you look at our paper, we, we do some examples of various constructions. So we, we, we take the tensor product uh, with different interval modules, and then we get these exact sequences. And the curious thing is that those sequences that we get seem to kind of have a, a space level interpretation. Uh, some of which we were able to make precise and some of which um, actually seem to have like non-trivial ways of making precise that at least worked in some examples. Things like taking uh, cohomology with compactly, support, compactly supported cohomology or things like that. Uh, and I think, uh, so that is a great question. There, there seems to be uh, a, like a space level interpretation of some of these algebraic operations that seems to be non-trivial. Uh, we, we say a few uh, things in our paper and then we leave the rest <laughs> for somebody else to do. So uh, great question. Uh, maybe you or somebody else in the audience will will give us some answers to that. I'd be excited to hear about that. 
Very interesting. I'll look at the paper then. Thank you. <laughs> More questions? Well, if not before I end the recording, let me just say thanks, Peter, for a wonderful talk and thanks to everybody in the audience for the very nice questions.